Hello, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Anksman, and I'm going to be your lecturer for the second half of the Physics 1A course. I'm going to be teaching you the thermal physics topic and also the topic about waves and oscillations. So if you need to contact me, you can email me. My email address is e.anksman at unsw.edu.au. Or if you need to find me, my office is just in the first year office. So it's in room LG04 in the old main building. LG stands for lower ground. OK, so let's get on with this thermal physics topic. Thermal physics is a bit more difficult than mechanics because it's less intuitive. We can't go back to fundamental principles as much. Where possible we will, but some of that is beyond the scope of this course. If you go on and do third year statistical mechanics, you'll be seeing where some of these equations come from. So for thermal physics, we need to use approximations. You'll be seeing one of these today. It also means that the often for thermal physics, experiments are harder to conduct. So unfortunately, there'll be a few less demonstrations than there are for mechanics. This lecture is going to cover sections 18.1 and 18.3 of your textbook, Fundamentals of Physics, by Halliday, Resnick and Walker. OK, so to start with, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law simply states that if object A and B are in separately in thermal equilibrium with object C, so that means no heat flows between A and C or between B and C, then object A and B are in equilibrium with each other. So A and B, there's no heat flow between A and B, as there was no heat flow between A and C or between B and C. The definition of temperature is really based on the concept of thermal equilibrium. Two things in thermal equilibrium are said to be at the same temperature. And things are in thermal equilibrium if when they're touching there's no heat flow between them. It's not always intuitive. Imagine a stool on a really cold day. It's got a bottom half made of metal and a top half with a cushion on it. On the cold day, if you touch it, the metal's going to feel much colder than the cushion. But in fact, they are at the same temperature. It's just that the metal conducts heat a lot more efficiently and so it will conduct the heat away from your fingers and it will feel colder to touch. Now there's several physical properties that change with temperature. One of these is the volume of a liquid. As we heat a liquid, its volume actually increases. Let's have a look at that happening now. What I've got here is a flask with some water with food dye in it and a capillary tube. I'm going to hold on to it with my warm hand. As I'm holding it, I'm transferring heat from my hand to the liquid, causing the temperature of the liquid to rise, and this is causing the volume of the liquid to rise. You can see that the liquid is rising up through the capillary tube as its volume increases. Another physical property that changes as something's heated is the dimensions of a solid. So we'll actually be looking at that in a lot more detail later in this lecture. Now the pressure of a gas at constant volume also increases as that gas is heated. So this is why it's really important not to store gas bottles near a temperature source such as a fire because if, the, um, if it heats up the pressure will increase which means there's a lot of extra force on the walls and this can cause containers to explode. Now the volume of a gas at constant pressure also increases. So an example of this is actually the Earth's atmosphere. This is kept at a constant pressure by the constant gravitational force acting on the gas. And so if you look at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, during the day it actually rises up slightly due to the heating from the sun. And then overnight, as the atmosphere cools down, it actually contracts and goes back down a little bit. You can also get colour changes with temperature. So you've probably seen mood rings or some of the thermometers that you stick on the side of fish tanks use this property. So you can get colour changes when you change the temperature. Traditionally, temperature has been measured with a the thermometer. 
How a thermometer works is it's filled with a liquid which expands as it's heated. So as it expands, it takes up more room in this capillary tube and so it moves along. Traditionally, these thermometers are cal calibrated at two temperatures. They're calibrated at zero degrees C, so it's put into a mixture of ice and water that should be at zero degrees C at atmospheric pressures. And when it's come to equilibrium, there's a mark made on the thermometer saying that that's zero degrees. The thermometer is then put into boiling water, which at atmospheric pressure is at 100 degrees C, and a mark for 100 degrees C is made on it. Between that zero and 100 degree mark is then split down into 100 little increments, and each of those is called a degree. That's how a traditional thermometer works. We now have much more accurate thermometers for using in experiments where a lot of accuracy is required. So there's three different temperature scales which are in common usage, degrees C, degrees Kelvin and degrees Fahrenheit. In this course we're not going to be using degrees Fahrenheit, this is traditionally used in the US and the Fahrenheit scale was set as 100 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to body temperature, which isn't an especially scientific way to do it, so that's why we're not going to use it. Zero degrees Celsius is defined as the temperature at which ice melts, and 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature at which water boils at atmospheric pressures. The spacing between a degree C and a degrees Kelvin is the same. So Kelvins are the most useful temperature scale. The temperature scale only has one direction. We do have an absolute minimum temperature. There's no absolute maximum temperature, though it is hard to get above certain temperatures because, I, I mean, there are atoms and particles have so much energy that you really can't keep them together anymore. So there's an absolute zero of temperature which is defined as zero Kelvin. Traditionally at this temperature we say all oh, motion ceases. I mean quantum mechanical effects come into play here and we get Bose-Einstein condensates and things formed which if you go on with physics you will learn more about. Zero degrees Kelvin is equal to minus 273.15 degrees C. So to convert between Kelvins and degrees C, we have to either add or subtract the 273.15. The next part of the lecture is going to require you to have a good picture in your head of solids, liquids and gases. So you probably learned about this in primary school. So just answer the question about this before going on with the lecture.